Sunshine style opening credits with the Fox logo actually played backwards to end on the sun instead of the logo. Seven years ago, the Icarus Project sent a mission to restart the sun. Killian Murphy is always a win, even when narrating. To create a star within a star. A little expectation subversion right from the get-go. That's no sun. Even the title card is intense and starts us off with a showcase of the destructive power of the sun as it incinerates the title of the film. Well, of course the Fire Lord from the Fire Nation is going to love a good burning. What? No, they love that video. What do you mean my subs are plummeting? The first unnarrated scene sets up one of the main conflicts in this film. This obsession or addiction where some members of each crew treat the sun like a drug. Look at him preparing for the wave. Or probably a more accurate description would be they worship the sun like a god. Hiroyuki Sanada is always a win. Probably a bit of an homage to the Alien franchise. We've got regular people living out their lives and going about their days. It's a smart step that always allows us to empathize with the characters. This will not be the last time I bring up the score. It's a constant ethereal wave of synth that's a mix of melancholy while still looking to the future. The band Underworld wrote the soundtrack and John Murphy added his own touches here and there. This track is all Underworld and to stand out next to the genius of John Murphy is worth noting. You've already written your Marvel DC crossover fanfic, so here's Captain America vs. Scarecrow for you. A lot of what this film is about is fundamentalism versus science or something like nature versus human ingenuity or human will. I don't always agree with everything the film posits, but I appreciate the way they communicate some of the themes. Mace's unkempt look in the opening of the film is Boyle's representation of his animal or primitive nature. It leads to combativeness and lapses in logic and restraint. Once he makes his promise to the captain, From now on, I'm not gonna lose track again. He shaves his face, cuts his hair, and embraces his civilized or modern side, which espouses going beyond and striving past his natural limitations. <laughs> It's no holodeck, but I'd take it. You go just first. Kappa, and... Kappa, it's me. I'm the one apologizing, all right? All right. Was that the apology? Yeah. Apology win. <laughs> Might be something that you'd overlook, as captains in space movies often wax poetic. They can't all be Picard, right? Well, if you look at the Icarus 2 crew, you'll notice that everyone is pretty much all business all the time, with the only exception being the ship's counselor, Cyril, who we already know is a tad off. So a captain making an official log, beauty wouldn't be something to comment on, especially as a hindrance to the mission. Clearly Kaneda notices and zeroes in on that. <laughs> Death by coolant shadowing. Remember, I said I would talk about the score. Yeah. It amplifies the pure collective awe these disagreeing scientists from different disciplines are all experiencing. Testament to this cast, this is a four plus minute long scene of pure exposition that never gets boring and is always intriguing. And it's the impetus for the rest of the movie. The distress call is the reason for every bad thing that happens going forward. Icarus, please plot our trajectory following the slingshot around Mercury. Now plot the source of the Icarus 1 beacon. How has this not been implemented into Google and Apple Maps? Such a simple thing I've always wanted. Here's my route, show me the McDonald's that's least out of my way. Come on. Well, Moon is the only sci-fi film featuring Benedict Wong I have left, so I guess at this point I need to throw it on the schedule. This will also be the fourth Benedict Wong film I've done. So win for his stellar career? Eh? <laughs> eh? We're delivering that payload because that star is dying, and if it dies, we die. Everything dies. That's his next position vein. So we're gonna make the most informed decision available to us. Made that person best qualified to understand the complexities of the payload delivery. Our physicist. Uh, appropriate reaction. And I love that Kappa is not involved or even shown in the entire discussion until it's revealed that the decision rests on him. I've noticed that when we're inside the Icarus, the colors are all similar shades of blue, gray, and green. This scene is specifically put through a blue filter. So when we go outside, we get such a stark contrast whenever the yellow sun is shown, making it all feel like a dream or nightmare. You didn't reset the shields to the new angle. My head was full of velocities and fuel calculations and a million different... I forgot! All right! The film's antagonist does move beyond this, but I really enjoy that the first real issue they run into is just a simple human error, something I think we can all totally identify with. I can't tell you how many times I've published a video and forgot major things I had planned or needed to do. Fortunately, people's lives are rarely on the line in respect to my videos. Rarely. <laughs> Just a good thing he got it together by the time Mark Watney needed his help. No, I volunteer. Fine. I volunteer, Kappa. 
Good thing Mace wasn't there with Prim that day. And if I'm being honest, this is one of the tiny issues I have with this film. Okay. Mace is all about the mission. I'll that becomes crystal job. clear on two separate occasions going Good forward. Job. So volunteering Kappa out of That's spite right. seems out of character. I'll give him a pass because the situation was not at all dire yet, and this little spacewalk shouldn't have been a life or death situation. Less your life isn't valuable, more you go stop the toilet from running. Not uncommon in space films, but I'll always love the sterile, bright white contrasted against the cold darkness of space. Metal's just contracting and expanding. I know what it is, Flyboy. It sounds like she's tearing apart. Besides, I'll just flame on if the ship explodes. And then our first real look at the destructive force of the sun. They're full damaged pumps. And the first look at how insanely large the ship and shield are compared to Kaneda and Kappa. Boyle always gives us a solid sense of scale and geography, which can be a difficult task in space action. Kappa, take it easy. You're going through your O2 pretty fast. Oh. Copy that, Kari. Yeah, so I always sort of knew already, but I definitely couldn't be an astronaut. Oh, my anxiety is bringing me closer to death at a faster rate? Okay, let me just turn that off while I fight the claustrophobia of this suit and the whatever the opposite of claustrophobia phobia is that describes the nothingness of floating through space. Like astrophobia plus agoraphobia. Astrogoraphobia. I love that the tech in this film is just sort of there. Some of it's current to our time, some more advanced. Some just variations or simple improvements on things we already have. They never explicitly say if the Icarus computer is AI, but she definitely understands the hierarchy of priorities. Negative, Cassie. Computer control. Returning vessel to original rotation. So here's the shot I used for the teaser frame, and I'm sure it was super obvious to those of you who have seen Sunshine, but I just love that shot so much. She's completely surrounded by destruction while still being completely safe and protected, yet all she wants is to enter. The symmetry and framing have always been something I love about this film. <laughs> It's not too often that a particular track or composition defines a film for me, but for so many reasons, Kaneda's death song does. There's so much going on. Kaneda initially sacrificing himself for his crew and their mission, and then when he realizes he isn't making it back, instead of trying to survive and inevitably dying in fear, he looks into the sun and gives us another glimpse at the power the sun holds over these people. So much that Searle pleads with Kaneda to describe what he's seeing as he dies. It's a beautiful and yet grotesque scene scored with one of the most emotional and glorious tracks ever. Love the way this quick cut is shot, showing Mace's reaction shot subtly in the reflection of the glass. Harvey said there's not enough oxygen to get us to the payload delivery point, but there is. Just isn't enough oxygen to get all of us there. And now we start to get into the harsh realities and the moral and ethical questions that arise when all of humanity's future is on the line. I think it'll be beautiful. For the record, physicists are allowed to use the word beautiful. Brian Cox said so. They're not bound by the militaristic stringency that the flight crew is. I just love the overall and basic concept of a ship flying to the sun being completely isolated in shadow the entire journey. These face flashes adequately creep me out. Something about a single frame doesn't even really matter what it is. It also starts to build the tension of their time on the Icarus One, even if your conscious brain didn't register the faces. 80% of all dust is human skin. That's actually a myth. Though in space, in an airtight ship, that kind of makes sense. We should split up. I'm not sure that's such a good idea. Are you play right. Might get picked off one at a time by aliens. If this one's a big ship, we can't search it effectively if it's still in one group. So, a cliche acknowledgement, then dodge, and then rationalization. I'll take it. The airlock's destroyed. There's only one suit. Cap is taking it. I like that while Mace's motivations seem pretty clear from the beginning, his commitment to that resolve is up for debate. Sure, it's easy to sacrifice someone else's life for the mission, but what if it was you? Well, he doesn't hesitate. Get out of the suit! That is a direct order. And Harvey's misstep may seem out of nowhere, but if you were paying attention during the Mercury scene, you would have noticed Harvey not looking at the passing planet, instead looking down. He's clearly thinking about something else, most likely looking inward and thinking about getting home to Earth. It's gonna be cold, but we'll make it. I mean, come on, if Star-Lord can do it, you don't wanna be outdone when Infinity War comes around, Cap. No, Harvey, it's me. Self-sacrifice number two. Man, talk about attention to detail. They have their own little Icarus emblem, and Pinbacker being on there leads me to believe that these are the names of the rest of the crew. Well, that's terrifying and makes me feel a little sick. It's that astrogoraphobia we were talking about earlier. And our first two deaths illustrate the two fears people have about space, either being way too hot or way too cold. Which, in this case, is totally not what would happen in the vacuum of space, since it would take much, much longer to radiate heat away from your body, but still makes for an awesome and terrifying shot. And at least he doesn't have to be cold forever. 
Well, Cyril ultimately got what he wanted to look into the face of the sun. So that's... And there was no malfunction on the airlock hardware. Which means the airlock was decoupled manually. Tens of millions of miles into space, the most terrifying thing isn't malfunctioning technology or even space itself. You're saying you need my vote. I'm saying you can't have it. I know, you're all thinking pretty dark subject matter for a movie called Sunshine. But I find Cassie's unwillingness to vote to be one of the most interesting statements about humanity. She knows Mace is going to do it. She knows her vote is empty. But she wants a clear conscience. She wants to be able to sleep. So her outwardly selfless or humane or decent act is actually completely self-serving. And she makes the other three carry the weight alone, under the illusion that they could have voted no as well. What are you asking? That we weigh the life of one against the future of mankind? Kill him. And I like that Cassie and Kappa ultimately have the same response. Clearly Kappa knows it has to be done, so much so that it's a foregone conclusion. So why are you asking? Right, to share in the guilt. Something Cassie's unwilling to do. Also puts a new spin on Spock's the one versus the many line when you're not the one. Trey is dead. They are only four crew members. Negative. Affirmative, Vickers, four crew, Mace, Cassie, Carzon, and me. Five crew members. One thing they did differently than other movies with a computer voice is actually have the voice actress, Chipo Chung, on set reading lines with the actors so there was a much more organic feel to the dialogue. Where is the fifth crew member? In the observation room. And this is where the film turns a lot of people. But I'll be honest, I think the reveal scene is done masterfully. I think most of the audience got this, but some did seem confused and thought it was a plot hole. Pinbacker survived for seven years because the rest of the crew was dead. There were plenty of supplies and plenty of breathable air for one man. Not the old god. My God. <laughs> Love the emphasis on the red blood against the washed out yellow foreground. And Pinbacker is shot in a constant blur like trying to look at the sun. This bending of reality was set up way back in the beginning when the supercomputer couldn't even calculate events within reason as they approached the sun. And who are we to say that direct exposure to the sun's radiation wouldn't change you or people's perception of you on a genetic level? Just call her Wally. And him, Eva? Ugh, a tiny glimmer of hope for Corey in her final moments. At least she dies with a smile on her face. It's an equally bold move by the filmmakers to tease us with hope to then summarily crush it. Man, I had forgotten that once the torture starts, it does not let up. But I love the distorted score painting a very clear picture of the searing pain Mace would be feeling. And fun fact, the reason you can see his breath is because the water he's in is actually super cold. So these reactions are pretty authentic. De detonating manually from the console. Unlock the airlock, they caught me. Unlock the airlock. I don't know how, just do it. Just do it. It also warms the heart to see these two, who have been at each other's throats the entire film, find some common ground and respect for one another as they approach their ultimate ends. Copy, me. Do it, Kappa! Do it. And obviously, self-sacrifice number three. This is the second time we see Mace's true intentions and what he really cares about. Leave it to the physicist to come up with a genius plan to pull the door open like this. Appropriate reaction and another basic problem that could easily be overlooked. Those suits are for low gravity and they're heavy. I think American space suits are like 300 pounds and these look to be even bulkier. Ugh, another reflection, this time of the payload floating away. My favorite track takes over again, drowning out Kappa's scream as he floats through space embodying his ship's namesake. And just in case there was any doubt about that connection to Icarus... Well, this just got real. But Cassie gets a saving your Kappa win. Another fun gravity is relative illustration, since gravity's pull would be from the center of the cube. One thing the camera work does really well is visually convey what Kappa was trying to explain about the theoretical nature of their mission. The freeze frames and warbling aspect ratio create a sense of confusion you can imagine would be extremely prevalent. What a glorious closing to his mission. What a beautiful scene. Time and space distort with Kappa in the eye of the storm, as it were, and for a brief moment, which I believe to be a very minute amount of time that's been stretched by the immense gravity and energy this close to the sun, he gets to relish in their success seeing exactly what he had described. The space between science and God, and he very poetically reaches out to touch God to again ultimately have his wings melted. And even though it's sort of a foregone conclusion that he was going to die either way, it's a last self-sacrifice win. One complaint I read a few times was that there was no fanfare or a governmental voiceover signaling that humanity had been saved? I guess people were a little confused? I'll just say that after reading that more than once, I've never been happier that Danny Boyle was in charge of this ending. Nothing would have sullied this film more. The ending is perfect. Initially, I was going to do Sunshine for the release of the Trainspotting sequel, but I chickened out when I looked at the box office return on this film. 3.6 million. Total domestic. Worldwide, it did 32 million. But that's kind of how Danny Boyle rolls. 
his openings are always pretty abysmal. He'll probably be more appreciated posthumously. So I don't expect this video to do super well for me, and that's okay. It's a film I'm passionate about and it deserves some attention. You guys also seem to like when I do sci-fi, so we'll see. Maybe I'll get a handful of you to check it out. I sort of threw it into my schedule on a whim at this point. After 28 Days Later, which I didn't see until 2005, I fell in love with Killian Murphy, and although I didn't know it at the time, also fell in love with Danny Boyle and writer Alex Garland. So anyway, I started going through Killian's catalog and always tried to stay apprised of his upcoming roles. Sunshine slipped past me until 2009, I believe because the marketing was just terrible, or maybe I was just aloof in 2007. Either way, a sci-fi film with my boy Killian, the Human Torch, Crouching Tiger Lady, and Ugio? How could I not love it? And then I did love it, for so many reasons. So we know Danny Boyle doesn't always get the critical acclaim he deserves. You've all seen Slumdog Millionaire, but The Beach, Train Spotting, Millions, 28 Days Later, see them. If you think this film is beautiful and moved you, keep track of Danny Boyle. The reason I avoided 28 Days Later was because I'd heard it was boring and it's not a genre I typically flock to. Now it's one of my favorite films. And another large part of that is John Murphy's score particularly in the house in a heartbeat. I used to run to that and Kaneda's death part two exclusively for years. So yeah, I like John Murphy and it's composers like him that are the reason I talk about scores in film. They play such an integral part of the emotional experience. Look at films like The Social Network. Before Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross came on board, it was a completely different movie. Okay, getting way off track here. Takeaway is music good, me like. Moving beyond the score, I see this film less as a character study and more of a humanity study as a whole. They're not the most complex characters, but let's be honest, sometimes people are one-dimensional. I've known plenty of maces in my life, and I'd really like to meet more Kappas. Most people are hard in the third act, and I understand their issue. The truth of the matter is, if you know anything about the Icarus myth, you really shouldn't have been surprised by the outcome. Icarus was too egotistical and flew too close to the sun, which led to his death. You could have made the film's antagonist space and left it at that. But it never really bothered me. It's set up right in the opening scene that the power of the sun has some unexpected effects on people at this proximity and intensity. Third act issues seem to be a common complaint at Danny Boyle films, but particularly in Sunshine, I think it fits perfectly with the story being told. Travel millions of miles away from the Earth, and power-hungry humans can still make the scariest villains. The sun is literally dying, and the biggest threat to humanity is still a human. Another interpretation that I like needs us to really embrace the god imagery of the sun. For practical intents and purposes, the sun is responsible for continued life on Earth. So you can look at this mission as their way to save our creator. As Searle quotes Pinbacker, We're only stardust. We get a glimpse into what Pinbacker may actually believe. There is truth that all the elements found inside us are formed in stars, making us ultimately nothing more than stardust. And so, if you have a god and a sun, then there will always be a devil. And that's one thing that Pinbacker can represent. There simply to destroy the sun worshippers. One other interesting take on the villain is that he's introduced bathed in light instead of dark, as is the usual frame for a bad guy. Which brings me to Alvin Kushler the cinematographer on this film. This is still one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen a decade later. The constant use of light and switches in color I talked about, and it has some of my favorite shots ever. So win for him. Go watch Hannah if you want to see more of his work. One last thing I'll add as a win is that Brian Cox was hired as the scientific advisor. While some things like orbiting around Mercury actually being really difficult, the typical sci-fi artificial gravity conundrum, and the time frame for the sun dying, everything else was pretty much as scientifically accurate as he could make it. And he did a bang up job. These are always the hardest movies for me to do, ones that I've seen numerous times and have some really strong opinions about. I could go on and on, but I think I've touched on the most important stuff. The fun in hardish sci-fi is going through it yourself and seeing what it says to you and the statements the filmmakers are trying to make. So go watch it. Next week, ish will be a film from another one of my favorite directors that was supposed to coincide with a film in theaters but i got my dates wrong and whatever it's already out you guys have been asking for it since day one hopefully sleep deprivation will only enhance my experience 